All right, and I did want to say a word about our men's conference that we went to on Friday night. About 15 of us gathered together, and about eight of us came together here at the church and carpooled over and enjoyed fellowship all the way over to Rockwall, to Lake Point Church, and uh, there were thousands of men there. I mean, churches all over the area. I think he said there was like 150 churches all over the world coming in by streaming uh, to all over, not only the United States, but the world itself connecting in for this. And there were five speakers. One of them was a speaker from uh, uh, Baylor, the coach of the uh, NCAA champions last year, Drew. Uh, what's his name, you know, you remember Drew, Drew's last name? What was it? Gray? Scott? Okay, Drew Scott. Okay, just drew a blank there. But anyway, coach of the Baylor Bears, basketball team championship, a um, uh, NFL uh, safety Dur oh, you're thinking of Derwin Gray. Okay, no, okay. I'm like, okay. Durr. Yeah, Derwin, we were talking about Derwin Gray earlier, and he was, they were, all the speakers were tremendous. Derwin Gray preached one of the best sermons on, on the prodigal son. Oh, it was so great, so powerful for men. And then the next two speakers came and, and blessed us, uh, Larry Osborne, and um, let's see, the third speaker, help me guys, who was the third one? Oh, he, Larry, uh, Larry Osborne was a third, and then the final speaker was a pastor from, I believe, Georgia, and he was fantastic, and I can't recall his name, but anyway, but the, t the content was stupendous, the things they spoke on for men, I mean, it's sort of like all four of them just had the right angle to share to men the struggles men are going through. Uh, Nino, Saturday morning, sent me a text, said, Pastor Bob, listen, thank you so much. The, the conference was unbelievable. It so helped me to set things right in my mind, in my heart, in my family. And so uh, I'm really thankful for all the men that were able to come. Some of them, you know, there were a couple that had to, you know, had to work. They just at the last minute got called in and couldn't make it, but but nonetheless, it was excellent. We're gonna, man, we're gonna keep trying to look for tremendous opportunities like this. And for our ladies as well, you know, we hear some great conferences coming through. We'll try to pull that together for the ladies as well, because it's worth doing, especially these uh, e Friday evening. Okay, I didn't know I could sing that high. But anyway, uh, but the Friday evening, uh, you know, doing it all in one Friday evening was just wonderful. It was great, and there was a great, Food there, we got to sit for an hour, hour and a half in fellowship before the conference, eat barbecue. It was great. So anyway, all right, well, let's go ahead and get started in God's Word today. We're walking through, just before our big fall campaign, where we're going to do a four-week wonderful series, a campaign, very special. We're going to have a special movie with Tony Evans and several other pastors in it. It's going to be stupendous. I can't wait to show that on the Word of God, how important God's Word is in our life. We're doing this little mini-series before that starts up in September on the book of Titus. And I'd like you to turn to chapter 2. We're going to cover the first part of chapter 2 today, and then we'll have two more messages, maybe three. But uh, we're going to do uh, just a few more. It's a very short book, but so incredible. What really struck me is that uh, Leah got up and she put some scriptures up at the end this morning. And it talked about the importance. Don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. Don't be weary in well-doing. And then we sang the song, uh, Mighty to Save. And we sang about doing good. And then we sang, or we're turning to Titus 2 here. Same thing. The more you go through Titus, the more you start hearing this. Do good, do good. Be a good example. So I want to start off, before we get into the scripture text, I want to start off with a story, and this is from a movie from many years ago, but this movie was called The War, The War. It's about a husband named Stephen, and there he is there, Kevin Costner, who returns from Vietnam, 1970, rural Alabama, 
or Mississippi. In one scene, his 11-year-old son, Stu, and his dad are at a crowded fair, an auction. They'd gotten separated. Stephen went off to get some cotton candy for his wife and his daughter who weren't at the fair with them. They were trying to see if they could make a bid at the fair. They were, getting, they were auctioning off places to live, and, and uh, they were going to see if they could find a house, a new house for the family. And Stu, the boy, is looking for his father in the crowd, and he comes across four boys there, just kind of rough around the edges. They're dressed raggedly, and they have it in for this 11-year-old, and they taunt him, and they taunt his father's desire to bid for this house at this auction. And one of them says, hey, punk, don't you know that you can't buy no houses with food stamps? Well, meanwhile, Stephen's holding two large cones of cotton candy from behind, and he's looking for his son. And as he finds his son, he sees one of those four boys headbutt Stuart in the stomach. So Stephen runs up to his son, and he says, hey, that's enough. And he calls the boy off and the other three boys and so the bullies run away, and Stephen reaches down, and he helps Stuart up. And Stuart has a bloody nose, and Stu says, I hate those kids. I hate them. His father prevents him from running after them. And then the dad says to his son, well, I, I guess it's all my fault. And they slowly walk back to the, their cars. Well, two of those kids, one of them is a girl now, and one is one of the other kids that was a part of that group of four boys. They're sitting there, and uh, Stephen, he's looking over at the two kids sitting not too far off, but one of the boys that is sitting there, he says this. He says, hey, trespasser. I know of a house your daddy can afford. Of course, a couple of robins living in it now. And so they just wouldn't give up their taunts. They wouldn't give up their, their uh, you know, their hatred for Stuart and his dad. Well, Stephen tells his son, son, get in the car. And that girl and that boy are sitting off there to the sides, and he walks to the, toward the two kids. And, you know, of course, they... They get dollar signs, or not dollar signs, but they get, you know, their eyes get as big as silver dollars. And they think he's coming over there to, to get them. But he walks over with the two cotton candies. You see, I think I got a picture, yeah. And he hands them the two cotton candies that he had just bought. Well, his 11-year-old son, Stu, looks on in, a, in amazement. As Stephen walks back to the car, and he says angrily to his father, he says, I hope you know that they're the kids that just beat me up. His dad said, I know who they are, son. Then why'd you give them mom and Lydia's cotton candy? And Stephen said this, because it looked like they hadn't been given nothing. In a long time, it looked like they hadn't been given nothing in a long time. Now, I think that all of us would have to agree that not too many moms and dads would react the way that the father in the story reacted. Uh, the reason for that is that in the world in which we live, where there's so much bullying and so much uh, animosity. Uh, a lot of times, mom and dads nowadays, they, they want kids to get what's coming, and they, they aren't compassionate like Stephen was, and they don't care. Even though people have done wrong, they aren't caring about showing love and compassion. And so a lot of times, mom and dads in the here and now, they'll just lose their tempers, and they aren't good examples like Stephen was for his son. They're not good examples at all. And it's just kind of overtaken our country. It's really difficult 
nowadays because, you know, this idea of being a good example, of being kind and compassionate and showing mercy to people who do us wrong, that's, that's kind of passe. It's kind of like the transistor radio. You know, anybody that carries a transistor radio around other than Brother Cook? But anyway... Uh, but who carries the transistor radio? You know, we've got iPhones, that, you know, and so on and so forth. Well, it's, uh, that's kind of how uh, this idea of being a good example is in our world. It's from a bygone era. Nowadays, it's you need to get your way. You need to get your own way and to make others pay. It's a lot easier to do that than to show people around you what Jesus would do if he was in your shoes. So this morning, we get ready to share the title of the message today. I want you to know that what I'm going to focus on today is this overarching theme in Titus 2 about being a good example. Listen, this isn't just for moms and dads, for kids. It's for grandparents. It's for all of us because you know what? We don't even if we don't have children and grandchildren around per se, we still are around people and we need uh, to be the light of the Lord Jesus. In one of the songs we sang, talk, shine the light, shine the light. And we were singing that this morning. Let your light shine. And that's, you know, the Lord Jesus. Let your light so shine, okay? So the title that I've given today about us being good examples that God calls us to be is this. Be an example. Be an example of good works. We're supposed to do good. We're supposed to be zealous for good works. And we can be an example of good works constantly to everyone around us, at work, at home, at school, you name it. But let's pray together and ask God to use this because we all need a wake-up call. Yeah, the world seems like it's going down to hell in a handbasket right now, but the truth of the matter is we have to be steadfast. Just like Jana was talking about, we have to keep on keeping on, doing what God's called us to do, and one of those things is to be a good example. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for the throne of grace. I thank you for my brothers and sisters and for all those that are joining us, Lord, and from afar, Lord, through the stream. And Father... We just bow before you and we ask you to use your word. Lord, I'm just the conduit. I'm just a way of getting your word to your people, to your sheep, to your flock. So, Lord, help us all to listen carefully to what you have to say to the church today, to our lives. And, Father, may it help us to do a greater work for you this coming week be more compassionate, to be a better example. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name, and for his sake, amen. Let's go back five years, almost five years, to September 7th, 2016. Author Ray Ortland wrote this in a piece. And I think, I think it was maybe in Christianity Today, but I can't recall. But he said, 50 years ago, my dad and mom gave me a new Bible, okay? So he's a teenager, okay? It was my senior year in high school, the first week of two-a-day football practices, and I crawled home bone-tired. Mom made a special dinner for me since it was my birthday, and dad gave me a Bible with the following inscription. And if you can't read that, that's okay. I'm going to read what's up there. His dad wrote in the front of that Bible on September 7, 2016, Bud, nothing could be greater than to have a son, a son who loves the Lord and walks with him. Your mother and I have found this book our dearest treasure. We give it to you, and doing so can give nothing greater. Be a student of the Bible in your life will be full of blessing. We love you, Dad, 9766. Over 50 years ago. You know, as I read these words that Ray Ortland wrote, they really got a hold of me. Listen 
to what he said here. He said, it never occurred to me as I read these words 50 years later to think something like this. Dad doesn't really believe that. It's just religious talk. I knew he meant it because I watch him live it. He was a student of the Bible, and his life was full of blessing. I wanted what he had. It took me a few more years to get clarity in some ways, but not surprisingly, on this day so long ago, my dad said something to me that left a deep impression. It moved me then, and it moves me now. You know, in our text today, the Apostle Paul, he's telling his son in the faith, Timothy, about the importance of being a good example, of leaving a deep impression on others. And as we saw last week, Paul asked Titus in chapter 1, Titus, set things in order. I left you behind on Crete, the island of Crete. I left you behind there so you could set things in order. We were getting things started, and now I need you to finish it off. I, and I need you in all the cities on this island, wherever there is a little home church of a handful of people meeting week after week, taking the Lord's Supper, sharing God's Word, I need you to appoint godly leaders, elders in every, every place. Titus, don't let me down. I need this from you. That's chapter 1. But now in chapter 2, Paul asks Titus to begin focusing not on the leaders so much, but the followers. What is Titus supposed to tell the people in the churches, the believers? Verse 7. And this is from the New American Standard, but I want you to notice what he says here. Paul's talking to Titus. In chapter 1, Titus, set things in order. Pick good leaders. Chapter 2, Titus, in all things, in every way, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. Hey, Titus, you're picking brand new leaders out. They don't know a lot about the Bible. They don't know a lot. They're going to be doing their best. Okay? Some of them are going to be a little bit newer than others, okay? You're on this island that's all by its lonesome out there. So you be a good example of good deeds. You set an example for those leaders. You tell the followers in those churches what a good example looks like. Do these things and do them so the opponents will be put to shame. The people that are resisting you, the people that are resisting the churches, the people that are in those churches teaching false things, so share with them what a person is supposed to be that they'll just feel ashamed and fall under conviction and have nothing bad to say about us. Some Bible says that, nothing bad to say about me. But the idea there is that these people that are causing problems in the churches will fall under God's conviction and say, I'm ashamed of myself. After what Titus just said to us, man, I've been doing the opposite of that. I'm a horrible example. And this, you know what, everybody, this is an amazing goal. Titus, let your life be so full of good deeds that the people that oppose you will feel ashamed and have nothing bad to say about you. He was to be a pattern, a pattern of good works, an example. Pattern, a type an example. When you hear about typology in the Bible, that's exactly what it is. It's a pattern. It's, it's a type. Uh, it's an example of something that's coming in the future. For instance, Joseph in the Old Testament was a pattern of the Lord Jesus to come. King David was a pattern or example or foreshadowing or a type of the Lord Jesus. So they were already in ancient times kind of giving people a glimpse of Jesus in their own time. You know, a lot of you, if you're probably old, older than 50, I don't know if you're under 50, if, and I don't even know, somebody tell me if they still make these nowadays. Do they still make these? They do? Okay, well, that's great because I thought, man, the sewing machine would have gone the way of, you know, Nintendo 64 or something, but anyway, anyway, uh, when I was growing up, my mom had a sewing machine, and man, she, 
She, she ran that sewing machine like I drove, pedal to the metal. <laughs> that needle was flying. And she would go and get a roll of, of cloth, okay? You see, uh, did you notice Rodney and I were Twinkies today? He had on that green check shirt. See, we both went to the same conference, heard the same preaching, Nino. Man, we wake up on Sunday morning, we're thinking the same way, even though we're miles apart. Anyway, but she would buy like a roll of material that looked like this. And then you go to the sewing store and you buy a pattern and see right there those shirts those guys had on, how cool the 70s were. Look at that. Anyway, those shirts, they would give you pieces of material. Here, let me put the next slide up. So this is what you'd pull out of there, something like this. And then you would, the ladies would take the material. My mom would take it and she would cut. She'd lay that thing out there and she would cut the material around the outside of that pattern. And, you know, they got numbers on there. So they've got like up here... Da 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 da, A B C D F, and they got no, and you just connect the dots, and boom, you've got a shirt, you've got a pair of pants. That's a pattern, okay? My mom didn't buy a, a bunch of cloth and go, oh wow, let's see, how am I gonna, how am I gonna cut the sleeves? How am I gonna cut this part of the shirt? No, she used the pattern. She just laid it out on the table, chip, 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 stick it on the uh, sewing machine, drrr, done, shirt. And you know they didn't have Amazon where you could call, you could, you could. Go on Amazon, and an hour later, there's a shirt sitting on your front porch. I love Amazon. That place is crazy. You know, you need something. It takes, it takes less time to order it on Amazon and get it there two hours later than you getting in the car and going walking around. Hey, can anybody help me? You're inside a Home Depot. You know, like you're like Moses in the wilderness. Hey, anybody out here? <laughs> you're trying to find somebody in electricity, and the guy comes to help you, and he's from plumbing. You know, I don't know about that. Anyway, no. You could get stuff, but you know, in the good old days when money was tight, until my mom find out, found out about these newfangled things, Madeline, called credit cards, J.C. Penny. Man, I think I didn't hear the sewing machine as much, but I heard my dad a lot more. My dad got paid once a month on the first of the month, and around the 12th, they had the same argument. Spud, I need $20. We're going out to eat today. Oh, Bill, we're all out of money. We're all out of money. <laughs> he would lose at the, you know, I, I would just, I, I, I heard it last month, so it wasn't anything new, so I just continued eating my cereal. We're all out of money. What do you mean we're all out of money? Well, Bill, you know, put all these on the credit card, and I have to pay the credit. And, you know, and it was the same thing all the time, but she was using that credit card a lot more. She should have stuck with the sewing machine. There was less arguing. But anyway, you get the idea, but this is a pattern. This is an example. This is how you make a shirt. Well, same thing. You know what? God wants us to be just like this. You say, how's that, Pastor Bob? Like this. Let your light, okay, you have Jesus dwelling in you through the, the Spirit of God. Let your light, your good works, so shine before people, men, humans, that... They may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Isn't that interesting? He says, hey, listen, just let them see your good works. Let just be a walking pattern of Jesus for others. Oh, I see it. I can put the pieces together by looking at your life. You're a great pattern of how to be like Jesus. And you don't get a shirt, you don't get a pair of slacks from the pattern, you get Christ-likeness from letting your light. And then others will be interested and be excited. So, Paul tells Titus to address three groups of believers here in chapter 2. And he wants to sh him to share with them the kind of example they should be. Okay, what groups were these, Pastor Bob? Okay, real simple. First, the older believers. Second, the younger believers. And then third, the slaves, for our purposes, we're going to call them believing workers, believing employees, okay? We don't have, in our time, uh, uh, Christian slaves. Like, and by the way, the slavery back then was not like it was in the 1700s and 1800s, 1900s in America, okay? The slavery was way different. They were basically employees for their master, employees in the home of a very wealthy man or woman. And so, so they became Christians. 
So you had older people getting saved. You had younger people getting saved that had families. And then you had these people that dedicated their lives to help a giant uh, home run efficiently and well. So here's the bottom line today, everybody. We're not going to have time to go through every single one of these qualities, okay? It just would take, there's so many here, it would just take too much time. I want you to get the overarching principle here. Good examples of good deeds, of a good example. Here are these qualities. Here's qualities for older people. Here's qualities. We, we're just going to read them and maybe talk about a few of them that maybe need more clarification, but we can't stop on every single one. But I know that you are going to be really familiar with most of these anyway. So let's start with the first four verses, okay? Okay. Now, he finished chapter 1 talking about the false teachers in these churches. Saved people, and they were undoubtedly teaching something along the lines of, unless you're circumcised according to the law of Moses, you can't be saved. <laughs> you know, they're on the island of Crete. Those are Gentiles. And so the Jewish believers are saying, have you been circumcised? No, I haven't. Well, you can't be saved. How can you be a saved person if you... Okay, you get the idea. It's just crazy, but that's the way it was back in that time. And so you got the word but there, and he's contrasting Titus with those people that are teaching bad things in the churches. And he says, but, in contrast with those bad teachers, as for you, Titus, speak the things which are proper, appropriate for sound doctrine, for good teaching. Teach them the things that are appropriate and that comport with good teaching, sound doctrine, okay? For instance, verse 2, that the older men be sober, okay? Reverent, temperate, self-controlled, sound in faith, Okay, you get the idea. Their faith is good. They have good faith in God, not a, not a faith that is wobbly, okay? Remember Brother Jim talked about wobbly <laughs> in one of the messages he brought here. Don't be wobbly. And he says, older men, don't be wobbly. When it comes to faith, be firm. Faith in God. Be, f be sound in love, how you treat others, in patience in how you endure. You know, don't give up. As you're getting older, don't give up on following God. Don't think, well, it's time for me to retire from serving God. No. Be sound in patience. Endure, endure, endure. So that's the word of the older men. Then the older women. The older women, likewise. The older women in the same way. You need to be an example. That you be reverent in behavior. Behavior. Not slanderers. Ooh, Greek word, diabolos. <laughs> diabolos, that's Spanish for devil. All right? Don't be devils. Don't be devilish. In other words, slander is just putting other people down, you know, gossiping and just talking about, oh, da, 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 da. that's a terrible example. Terrible example for your kids, for your grandkids, for people at work. Oh, that person says they're a Christian? Really? Wow. Their lips are on fire. All they can do is cut people down. Older ladies, don't be given to slander. Don't be given to much wine. Don't be drunkards. Don't be, don't all be drinking too much. Be teachers of good things. Why? Verse 4, and I put the, did I put it on? Yeah, and you see, I put the word so in a little box because the Greek word, is the word that means so that. Sometimes they don't put the so in there, but four times in Titus 2, that Greek word, henna, is there. So that. You be this way, older women, so that you can admonish, you can warn, you can encourage the young women. Okay, be this way, be this example, so that you have even the, uh, the character that you can talk, you know, if, if, if you're the, known as the church gossip and you say, hey, I'm going to start teaching the younger women a class on how to bring up your kids, the younger women may say, uh, I think I'll take a rain check on that, blabbermouth. <laughs> so 
So the elder women are to be godly, Paul says, so that they could admonish, warn, encourage, bless the younger women. Look at verse 4 again. Uh, let's see here. Yes, okay. So that they could admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, pure, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. By the way, let me stop there. That's mutual, everybody. <laughs> yes, we're talking to women right now. We're talking to the younger women here. But if all you got to do is turn to Ephesians and say, listen to this, gentlemen, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The Bible's way is always mutual love, mutual submission, mutual obedience. It's not a one-sided thing. And, you know, a lot of people would squawk reading this, but they don't read the Bible far enough. Okay. Be obedient to your own husbands. And here's that, so that. Teach them these things so that the word of God may not be blasphemed. That means insulted. That God's word, you know what? There's people all over that island that weren't believers. And if the women who are younger don't know how to rear up their kids and they don't know how to love their husbands and all those things and the husbands don't know how to love their wives, what happens is that Paul is telling Titus that if you don't help them do this, then the word of God will be insulted. It will be maligned. Uh, the word of God is good, but when we're hypocritical and not living according to it, it's bad. Okay? So, that is the older men and the older women. But what about the younger believers, the younger men, the younger women? Okay? Okay, we already looked at some of the things the younger women needed to be. Okay, he's calling them to be great managers in the home. Okay, let's see, did I have a thing to put up there? No, I guess I forgot to do that. Oh, yeah, there it is, younger believers. That's what, okay, that's what I was looking for. Okay, so he's calling women to be great managers, where it says home, homemakers, home. That, that is, t God's telling them, listen, manage the home well. Your husband will help you, but you each have specific responsibilities, okay? Now, many today would balk at the call for women to be obedient, but I want you to hear what two uh, excellent commentators on God's word, Griffin and Lee, they wrote this. In considering the New Testament teaching on marriage, especially in Paul's letters, the emphasis appears to be on the maintenance of a mutual, remember I said both of you working together, mutual or reciprocal. One gives and the other gives. One gives and the, a reciprocal commitment of the husband and wife to an exclusive, intimate, loving, and caring partnership. It's a partnership. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, you need to be a team with your spouse to raise those children and grandchildren up. Submission and obedience here goes both ways. So dad and mom work together in love to be a great example. Listen, mom and dad work hard to be a great example of what the children's marriage, marriage should be like when they get older. If you don't set that for your children... They're going to be like, I don't know how to do this. They get married, but all of a sudden, they're struggling. Whereas you can set a long-term example for them. It doesn't mean that they're always going to do it. When they get older and fly the nest, it doesn't mean they're always going to follow what you did and the example you set. But many times it will, and what a blessing it is when they do. Now, Titus doesn't say too much about the younger men. Don't really know why, but this is God's word, so I'm not going to deal with it. It talks about him in other places, but Titus 2.6, I guess maybe he just wanted to give a one-word sermon to them because they needed this the most. Exhort the young men to be sober-minded. 
This is a word I put up here, sensible. Uh, I remember Warren Wiersbe years ago, he says, having your spiritual thinking cap on. Sensible, sober-minded. You know what being sober is, right? The opposite of sober is being drunk. So he said, as a human being, don't be like a drunk. Don't be like somebody that can't do anything, right, because they're stumbling all over and every, they can't drive, they can't talk, they can't think, they can't set an example. Don't be like that. He says, young men, you have your spiritual thinking cap on. You be sensible, young men. and Do what's right and set a good example. The older and younger believers are to be good examples in church and at home. But Paul's got one more area that he wants us to know about. We're examples. They matter in a huge way. How we behave as believers on the job. Huge. Okay? Or right, how about this? Huge. I missed that. Anyway, huge. Okay. Number three. Okay? Believing workers. Believing workers. And I'm going to paraphrase here because it has slaves and servant and all that. I'm paraphrasing it for 2021. This is Pastor Bob's paraphrase of verses 9 and 10. Encourage employees to be obedient to their own bosses, to please them in all things. They must not talk back or steal, but show themselves to be entirely trustworthy so that, oh, there it is again, so that, they may make the teachings of God, our Savior, attractive in every way. Did you hear that? On the job, we are to make the teachings of our God and the Bible that we carry, we are supposed to make those teachings attractive. Make people hunger for them. You know what? We should be so different from the people around us at work. You know, sometimes Christian people are grumpy. Sometimes Christian people, and by the way, I don't mean like one morning when you had two flats on the way to work. I'm talking about they're grumpy on Monday, they're grumpy on Tuesday, they're grump and they're Christians. They're grumpy every day. Or they're complainers. And they're whiners and stuff. And they're at, like that at work. And then at lunchtime they say, Hey, could I take a few minutes and tell you how you could be sure you're going to heaven when you die? Are you going there? Yeah. Okay, forget it. <laughs> you get the idea. Okay. Okay, in God's mind, our good example as his children needs to be continual all the time and lifelong. Younger men, younger women. Older men, older women. Okay, lifelong, in our homes, in our churches, on our jobs. When we treat others like Jesus, Jesus would, we impact them, and it opens a door for the gospel. You know, I'm praying for us that God will open doors for us to have uh, uh, an open door for the gospel, to share the good news, like to share our stories with others. Hey, can I tell you a great thing that happened to me? This happened many years ago, but I just so overwhelmed by what, happened to me. I want to share it with you. And, you know, I'm praying for that, but you know what? We all need to be doing our part to be good examples, full of good works, zealous for good works. In fact, that was the very next slide. I, I was doing it out of my brain, but that was right in the next one. Okay, if you go down to verse 14, we're going to look at this next week, but he says we're to be a special people, a special people. Do you see that? Who? God's people? Special people. Zealous. By the way, that's my only grandson's middle name, Zeal. At first I thought, well, that's kind of strange. But then after I thought about it, I liked it. Ethan Zeal Rawson. Yeah. Be zealous, Ethan. Be zealous. Whatever God wants you to do in your life, be a zealous young man for God. I like it. And we are to be zealous for good. Hey, it shouldn't be just like, hey, every once in a while, okay, hey, you know what? Hey, listen, I, uh, you know, I took the trash out for Ed at the church one time this year. Praise God, I did my good works for 2021. No, 
Man, we ought to be looking all the time, everywhere. What could I do to be a blessing to others, okay? I want to close with this story. In Christianity Today, uh, this magazine, this writer named David Briggs, he shared this really powerful story about example. And it flowed from the life of his dad, his father. His father was an ordinary man who lived an ordinary life. He worked at a screen printing company in New Haven, Connecticut. But his son David, in this article, he talks about how he was permanently shaped by his example. He was humble and he was faithful. Okay? Humble and faithful. Now, these are David, um, David Briggs' own words. He said, before I was old enough to go to school, Dad often took me into work with him on Saturdays. I watched him sweep the floor before he began, <laughs> and soon I had that job. He was hired to sweep floors. But even after he began to work on projects for famous clients, it was important to him not to lose sight of the dignity of all work. Faith in God was just part of my life. Some of the best memories I had from childhood were attending midweek or Sunday worship services or, one time, the adventure of walking together with Dad down a long hill with snow up to my chest during a heavy storm on Sunday morning only to be greeted by a surprised pastor on Sunday morning at the door. My dad would not miss Sunday worship. Y'all hearing that out there? <laughs> okay. Oh, 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 what's the matter? Oh, I, I, I got a hangnail. Oh, I guess we're going to have to stay home from church today, honey. You know what, everyone? I don't, you know, when I'm sick, I come to church and preach. I had brain surgery. Doctors told me, Bob, you're going to probably not be able to work for eight or nine months. I said, how about five weeks? I was only out that long because they wouldn't let me drive for four weeks. But I was gone, I think, four or five Sundays, and I was here in the pulpit. And I couldn't feel my face. I had dribble coming out of my mouth because I couldn't feel my face anymore. Thankfully, I got over that. One day, I was eating breakfast, and I ate a bowl of cornflakes, and I'm on my way to church, and I'm driving down Centerville, and I got halfway to church, and I happened to look in the rearview mirror, and I had a cornflake on my cheek sitting there. Oh, wow. So anyway, but you know what? Way too lazy, way too selfish. You got God way down low on your totem pole. You know, I've had people say to me, in fact, one of them has joined our church recently. He went around and, and visited churches all around here. And he said, Bob, he said, I visited all these churches, and he says, you are hands down the best speaker. He says, I don't know why you don't have that place loaded every Sunday. Well, the problem is, is because a lot of people in Ridgepoint are stiff-necked like the, old, the Jews of old. I was just listening to that passage yesterday, and their necks are stiff, and they don't want to listen to what God wants them to be, and so they just blow God off like nothing. That eh, doesn't matter. I don't matter. My life doesn't matter. My example, my... You know what? How about if I felt that way? How about if I just said, hey, you know what? I'm only going to come once or twice a month at the most, okay? I'm, not, I'm just going to come once or twice a month. You know what? I, you know, because I'm, I'm busy. I'm working on a doctorate. I repair computers on the side. I'm busy. What if I said that? I can't do it. You know, I got all these papers to do. You know what? No. It, you know what? 
When I'm gone, I'm usually on vacation. I was gone for a wedding in July. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, a few weeks ago, well, I was here, you remember, right? I was standing up here and I was preaching and I could t- couldn't talk. I'm like, hey. But you know what? I felt fine. I just couldn't talk. I'm not going to just use that as, oh, h- hello, uh, Brother Jim, I know it's only uh, Saturday night, but I-, I can't talk. And, you know, would you speak for me tomorrow? And poor pa- uh, Brother Jim's got to sit there and dig and dig and dig and get prepared. That's tough. Last minute. But you know what? If you're sick, that's fine. Okay, you're too sick to come to church, or if you got something that's contagious, I'm not saying for you to come. Okay, I'm, I'm way far away. I can stand up here if I'm contagious. And, but, yeah, and I'm not going to come like, for instance, if I got a horrible fever and sit there and give you all hugs or something like that. But you get the idea. I'm just saying it's pretty hard for godly people for them to be, stay away out of church. Okay, it's so important. It's so important. Well, David Briggs continues, where there might have been self-pity in my dad's life, there was joy in his life. There was something more. I didn't pick it up at first, but as the years went by, I noticed that, noticed my father would not speak a bad word about others. At the dinner table, he talked about customers who defrauded him by asking for large amounts of work in advance and skipping out on payments. But there was never talk of revenge or fighting back. He just said he would no longer deal with them. He would no longer take their business. For almost my entire time growing up, a lot of it during the 1960s when racial tensions boiled over in cities like New Haven, Connecticut, my dad delivered food once a month to the poor in the city telling me when I came along to stay in the car while he walked up to the top floor of apartment complexes to make sure families received their groceries. In a letter to my father as he lay dying, I spoke of our walk to church during the snowstorm. But I told him the lesson he taught me about Faith came from seeing you live your life. You genuinely loved everyone. My father was born into poverty, lived a humble life, and died in bleak, spare surroundings reserved for veterans with limited resources. His was a Christmas and Easter story combined testifying that true happiness lies within us. So what do I want to do with the rest of my life, David Briggs said? What do I want to do with the rest of my life? I want to be like my father. How are you doing? How are you doing in this matter of being a good example, being an example of good works. We're to be a special people, zealous of good works, zealous of good works. So our application this week is on this this, uh, arching theme in Titus 2 and in Titus 3, really the whole epistle, but be examples of good works. Uh, Looking for that blessed hope. Here's next Sunday's text. Looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself from us for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a special people zealous of good works. Jesus was our example. We follow him and we glorify God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Good works, good example. Be a pattern, be an example. Show the world. They can't see Jesus. They could only see him in us. Let's do it constantly, everybody, as much as we possibly can. You know, I know 
all of us, all of us, we lose it from time to time. So we lose our temper. We get fed up. We get tired. We, something, you know, I know that. But you know what? God is not looking for perfection in us. He's looking for people zealous of good works. He's not going to stand up in heaven when we see him and say, say, uh, did you obey me every moment of every day? <laughs> no, he's going to say, Bob, were you zealous of good works? Did you make a difference for my kingdom, my name? That's what he's going to want to know. Let's bow our heads in prayer. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, Father in heaven, we come to you and we recognize that, Lord, many times we fail to be a good example. Lord, we're lazy, we're selfish, we are moody, we want our own way, we want to hang on to our own cotton candy, as it were. And Father, we ask you to forgive us. Father, we ask you to so work through these words today from Titus 2 that we'll leave here different people, that we'll be looking and zealous for good works, Lord, being an example to everyone around us of what the King of Kings and Lord of, Lord, Lord of Lords is like. Jesus, we ask these things in your most precious name. Amen. Everyone, have a wonderful week. Thank you, all of you that joined us. And we pray that uh, you'll be a blessing to everyone around you. We pray that you'll get to bring somebody to Jesus this week. All right, have a great, great week, everyone. Be sure to stop by Leah's table when you leave and uh, tell her thank you. All right, thank you, everyone.